one thing that comes up very often is how leaders, African leaders, at least whether it's South African, uh, Kenyan, you know, but also Senegal or Ghana, how they present themselves as the gateway to Africa. And that's something that started with South Africa. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Several countries are vying for Africa's attention. While there has been considerable focus on China's and India's motives and interests, Russia, Germany, France, the UK, Turkey, Japan, South Korea, and Middle Eastern countries are all trying to increase their footprint on the continent. An important first step for many of these countries is to organize a summit, a major gathering of leaders and other high-level officials to discuss how African countries can further strengthen trade and diplomatic relations with this one country hosting the summit. The goal of these summits, or these high-profile events, is basically to promote the idea of achieving win-win outcomes for all involved parties. And this growth in so-called Africa Plus One Summit diplomacy has generated considerable interest in better understanding the growing competition among world powers on the continent. But in trying to explain this growing interest in strengthening relations with African countries, there's often a tendency to downplay the role and influence of African countries in setting the agenda of these high-profile events, and also how African leaders actually articulate their needs and interests. My guest this week argues that we really need to better understand the motives behind this increased engagement in Africa Plus One Summitry by African politicians and bureaucrats. Indeed, rather than viewing these individuals as passive participants, we must recognize the numerous ways in which such summits and other high-level platforms that involve the continent offer opportunities for African leaders to express and exert agency in both symbolic and substantial ways. Dr. Fola Shade Sule is a senior research associate at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. She studies agency in Africa's international relations and the politics of South-South cooperation. She's also the initiator of the Africa-China Negotiation Workshop Series, which brings together African negotiators and senior policymakers to exchange and build better negotiation practices when dealing with China. We discussed why some high-level summits are more attractive to African leaders than others, the characteristic features of South-South cooperation that sometimes help policymakers claim back economic policy space, and how African policymakers can negotiate better deals with China. I hope you enjoy our conversation. It's great to have you on the show, Fola Shade. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for having me. Let's begin with this growing phenomena, Fola Shade, of all of these major summits that it's not just India and China, but all kinds of countries, European countries, it could be UK, it could be Russia and, and Germany, other Asian countries. All of these countries are having summits and interested in interacting with the whole continent of Africa. And we see this happening, you know, quite regularly. And these meetings, at least as I see it, they, they tend to focus on strengthening trade and investment relations. They're discussing uh, security matters. Sometimes they end up creating new platforms for, for a renewed 
relationship with countries on the African continent. Indeed, they seem to be conveying this message, these summits, that Africa, the whole continent, is important, not just for, for some countries, but for the whole world. And while some of these summits have been dubbed as a new scramble for Africa, in a fascinating article in African Affairs, you've argued that this new scramble narrative is actually quite misleading. So let's let's begin there. Why do you think that new scramble narrative is misleading? Well, as you said, then it almost seems when you look at the, the dynamism and the the number of summits that are taking place, you know, centered on Africa. When you look at also some countries like that, that are, let's say, not conventional, like Malta, Estonia, lately Iceland, they are all producing Africa strategies. It it really seems, uh, and it, it is also the case that Africa has taken almost like the center stage of the global investment agenda. So now the continent is considered as the next frontier. No, uh, it's the next Asia in Africa. And um, fine direct investments and international projects in key areas such as you know, energy, infrastructure, finance have become major driving forces behind the, the, the unparalleled growth of African markets. And we are now talking, we are in a COVID period, but statistics are showing that the, the continent will suffer from you know, the pandemic, but several economies will be uh, back on track again. So, and this has been happening now for a few years, the way uh, not only the media, but also the researchers are describing this phenomenon is as you know, the, the new scramble, the new scramble for Africa and referring to the old scramble, the, the one from the Berlin conference, you know, where former colonial powers decided to to divide the continent in according to their interests where but also at this conference there were no African representations. The continent had and its populations, they had nothing to say about it. And so referring to this current context of Africa being at the center stage of the global investment agenda as the new scramble is something that was uh, that I considered a bit misleading because we are talking about two different contexts. We are talking about two different you know, statuses to some extent because all the countries, all African countries are now independent. So they have their say in this agenda. Saying that it's the new scramble is a way of saying that all this strategy is only decided and carried out by either Western countries or emerging powers like China, Russia, India. Whereas what I demonstrated in the article is that African governments, African leaders also have their own strategy. And all this summit diplomacy, but more generally speaking, they are also in competition with one and, uh, with one another to attract investments from these various countries and, and new partners. I, I think that is a very important point, Fola Shade, because some would say this is great for Africa because all of these countries have been long neglected in terms of investment destinations, and, and, and this is great in terms of beginning new partnerships, all of that. But I absolutely see your point that there is this tendency of describing all of these events as being being decided by others. And it's not like they, in, in terms of, say, African leaders deciding to even take part in these summits. Nobody is forcing them to take part. They make up their own minds to participate. So And they choose. And, and I think that is what, what I really like in your piece, because we tend to be dismissive of African agency. And it's about time we actually discussed what is it? It must be a sophisticated strategy in many ways. So, 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 what? Why do you think the African leaders actually, and not just the leaders, but sometimes their their bureaucratic representatives, why do they actually decide to participate for Lashali? What What do they hope to get 
from these major summits? Well, you know, Alain, as you, you mentioned, um, the reason why I decided to focus the article on agency, you know, agency not only as a sociological concept, but also as a political concept, is that I wanted to ask the following questions that were, what are the motives behind African leaders' increased engagement in Africa plus one symmetry, right? And uh, to what extent does it serve their own interests? Because we mentioned the leaders, the governments, but we can also uh, ask about the populations, right. of course. And, right. And so um, one thing that I noticed uh, is that, well, first they choose, and that's why it's so different. They choose to attend, African leaders choose to attend, and that's why it's so different from the, the Berlin Conference uh, scramble narrative. But they also choose to, to attend some summits and not to attend others. I found that very fascinating. So it's like, you know, they set, sometimes they decide as presidents to attend some very high-level meetings, and sometimes they, they decide to send their juniors. Yes. Exactly, because it's the in summit diplomacy, it's the level of representation, you know, that also determines or is a sign of a country's interest in a specific event. Attending as a president or sending your Ministry of Foreign Affairs, well, it's these are not the same levels. It shows a different kind of interest, right? And so. What I noticed is that these leaders, African leaders, choose more and more to attend, in, at the presidential level at least, summits with China or with Russia, whereas 20 to 30 years ago, they would have shown more interest in attending you know, the UK-Africa summit, if, if there was one, or, you know, the, the France-Africa uh, summit, or even they are attending, currently they are attending these uh, summits with rising powers in a, in a larger numbers, more than they attend the United Nations General Assemblies in September. Right? So, at least I consider it as a sign of interest, but also because you know, and you asked me before, what are their motives, right? And in the article, I really separated four different motives and so four different uh, strategies, actually. And the first one being attracting investments, you know, uh, because investments for African countries is a common priority, but they are all in competition. And among the 20 countries that are topping the foreign direct uh, investment inflows and outflows. Currently, none is located in Africa, but FDI flows in Africa are very much located in top five recipient countries that are Egypt, South Africa, Morocco, Ethiopia, and the Congo. So in this context, these countries are very much in, in competition to attract this FDI, and all these platforms offer an opportunity to promote their countries as the best environment for these investments. So this has been, this is actually not new because this has been expressed in several platforms, several events, uh, like uh, trade meetings in the US, Kenya. While all these countries are trying to position themselves as regional economic hubs, this competition is a way for them, you know, to attract investment, but it's also an internal priority for these governments. Like African politicians, you know, and political parties, they need to demonstrate to their electoral promises, to their populations, that they are able to deliver, right? And so that's why also countries like China and summits organized with China become interesting because... Well, it's an opportunity to get hard infrastructure you know, to be funded and locally at the local level to target communities and localities that are, you know, in need of maybe a road or, you know, a, a certain infrastructure. So it's, there's an interdependence, of course, between the domestic level and the, the international level. So for these governments to go 
uh, for, for these African leaders to attend these summits is also a way for them, you know, to attract investment and to be be able to, um, or at least to expect to gain votes from certain constituencies, and to counter also growing dissatisfaction by uh, by some civil society movements. When you look at some countries like uh, autocratic countries, uh, like Togo, you know, or, or, or Guinea. Having all these partnerships and you know bringing for these leaders at least to be able to show well you know this is what we are doing is also a way for them to at least try you know to um, to to counter some growing dissatisfaction by some civil society movements and we can discuss whether this is you know something positive or negative but at least that's the strategy. That's a great point. You know, I was thinking about how the narrative maybe has shifted in terms of these summits. Because traditionally, I always got this feeling when whenever a major power was announcing one of these summits with the whole of Africa, there was this feeling that, oh, we are doing Africa a favor, you know, that we are going to lift you out of poverty, that we are going to help you develop. I feel that that maybe has shifted of late where... And I'm thinking about, you know, the UK Africa summit that was held last year, where it appeared to me much more about, at least if you read between the lines, it appeared to me, and I may be wrong, you can correct me. It appeared to me that it was also about the UK having left or decided to leave the European Union seeking new opportunities. It wasn't just you know, for Africa, it was also win-win, something that the Chinese have been highlighting for, for many years. One of the things that I, many things I liked about your piece was that these numbers you you had about how the last China-Africa summit, the FOCAC summit, was attended by 51 African leaders. And out of these, there were 48 presidents. Whereas the UN General Assembly in September 2017 in New York only had 27 leaders attending. And the Russia-Africa summit had 43 heads of state, of which there were 38 presidents. But the UK-Africa summit only had 21 leaders, of which there were 16 heads of state. So, Fola Shayande, what does this say about the UK, the former colonial powers? It could also be France. Does it indicate that African countries are less interested in pursuing these new or renewed relationships with former colonial powers and much more interested in newer relationships? Well, you know, I remember this quote by President Macky Sall from Senegal. Right? He was at a conference, I think it was a U.S. investment uh, conference. And um, in these platforms, African leaders tend to be Maybe the word is strong, but it is sometimes criticized, right? Criticized for engaging with China or with Russia. And his answer was China and Senegal, China and Africa have a very uh, particular and special relationship. But everybody would gain a lot from listening to what Africans want, to what African governments are expecting from this relationship. And why am I quoting him? It's because the sense that these leaders have, that African leaders have, is that rising powers, or you know, maybe we can't really call them rising powers now anymore, but China, Russia, also Turkey, are listening more to their demands, right? Or they are at least trying to find uh, a partnership that is also aligned on these African government's interests, or at least what they've you know, mentioned in their national development plans. And a, and a very specific aspect of that is infrastructure funding. So let's say you're an African leader. Infrastructure is a key priority. Economic infrastructure is a key priority of your national development plan and your strategy because, well, you consider that it may lift some people out of poverty because they will have more access to you no know, specific um, specific uh, things. Well, attending a summit like 
the China Africa or Russia Africa or Turkey Africa might give you more opportunities to get this infrastructure funded than attending a UK Africa or a, a France Africa summit. And, you know, I'm, I'm quoting them a bit because in my engagement and, and interviews with leaders or with African uh, high level officials, this is what comes up very often. This idea that in order for their invest for their infrastructure projects and also other projects to be funded, it's easier for them to reach out to China, Russia, Turkey than to the UK because the UK or France or even the EU strategy with Africa, infrastructure is not a key priority. That is also my understanding for La Chandie, because I feel that whenever I've uh, interacted with policymakers, be it uh, the presidents or prime ministers or senior civil servants, they often talk about, well, they wouldn't say it loudly, but it is often about playing the field, diversifying the kind of partnerships they have. That, you know, the wonderful thing about increased attention from all of these powers particularly from China and India and also Turkey, South Korea, the UAE, is the fact that it isn't just the traditional Western donor concerns that they have to address, but it is also, as you were saying, infrastructure. So this expanding or claiming back policy space perhaps is, is crucial, right? So yes. having the, the capacity to actually do the things they want, they consider important, that their voters consider important, is important. This is not to say that areas such as education or health are unimportant. It's just that infrastructure is something that the West has long not prioritized. And so so how do you see this thing about, you know, this policy space? Is that also your understanding when you've interacted with leaders and bureaucrats that they're interested in expanding and reclaiming that economic policy space? Exactly. Absolutely. And that's what I mentioned in the article, right? That the, one of the, the second or the third strategy is also to claim back this economic policy space. So... You know, infrastructure used to be a priority uh, or at least part of the aid agenda back then. And the World Bank was also very much invested in this. I'm talking about, you know, the 80s and the 90s. Yes. But there has been a shift in the aid agenda at some point with the Millennium Development Goals also, you know, in 2005, where education, health, governance matters became more important. So... One thing, one pattern, when you look at all the Chinese funded or Chinese constructed infrastructure in Africa, these projects, African leaders or African officials asked funding for these projects to the European Union or to Western countries uh, before they asked it to China, but they didn't receive a positive response, right? So... Uh, th there has been a shift there. And so looking at it from an African perspective, what these leaders are doing is just you know, something like a basket strategy mm -hmm. where uh, they, have, they know that for infrastructure, they will go to China, Russia. And since infrastructure is so important to them, they will uh, really prioritize strategic partnerships with China, Russia, Turkey, uh, and, and, and so mainly with these countries. Um, but with, you know, for projects uh, related to well, health, education, uh, you know, also in projects related to sustainable development. Well, then they have the EU, they have also the US. To some extent, the US is a key player in, in humanitarian aid as well. Um, so, you know, it's about diversifying and be able to have multiple partners in order not to depend on one. So in terms of uh, policy space, you know, there has been a very strong interventionism in African government's policy space and on how they should organize their policies. And I'm thinking about the structural adjustment programs led by Bret the Bretton Woods Institution in the 90s. You know, so we all know that 
this loan conditionality was based on several rules and and also what the effects have been on African economies, the defunding key sectors like transport, health, and so on. Well, with these new partners, what African governments are able to do now is also to claim back the way they are thinking their development plans or their development strategies. And again, we can discuss further whether, you know, this is uh, something that has more or less positive or negative effects, whether it's a good strategy or not. But that's the strategy. That's how they think. And so bringing in China, bringing in Russia, diversifies partners and, of course, makes their policy space much larger. Yeah, I, I like that argument, Paula Chardet, because you're basically saying that they're not passive recipients. Here you have a new crop of leaders, countries now actively setting the agenda. I remember having these kind of discussions in Rwanda a couple of years ago where I got the impression, you know, whether you're for President Kagame or against him, the impression I got is that he wasn't interested, the Rwandan government wasn't interested in being told that we will help you in this sector. It was rather the Rwandan government saying, we've decided that you can have the opportunity of helping us in infrastructure, education or health and and actively you know, setting that agenda rather than that agenda being set for them. And I think that is the the shift that is happening. But one of the things I wanted to ask you, Folashade, is how does it work in terms of the competition between African countries? You mentioned this earlier on in our discussion, that there is this competition. There are maybe five or six major African economies that tend to get all the major investments. It could be South Africa, could be Kenya, the big countries. And I see this discourse increasingly in relation to these summits or, you know, what China or India or any other country is doing in, in, on the African continent. So on the one hand, there's this narrative that we're doing it with all the countries. But in reality, there are some countries who bag all the major investment projects. So how do you think that is working out between African leaders. Is there kind of resentment that some countries end up getting all the plum investments while others are just picking up the crumbs? And do you think some countries are coordinating their their strategies when they come and present Africa as a continent? Or are we still seeing bilateral negotiations rather than Africa negotiating as a continent? Yes, well... Let's say that, first of all, there's a double competition, right? There's a, there's, or at least there's a competition at two levels. There's competition among African nations, and there's also competition among all these new partners, right? And we, we can come back to that later, how China, uh, Russia, and, and Turkey, for instance, compete in, in these countries. But the level of, you know, involvement by African heads of state and the level of attendance also in terms of ranking um, shows how these all these leaders are representing their countries um, are expecting to get something out of these platforms. And so they are in competition, but I won't call it resentment. I would say that you know their strategies tend to differ, you know, one from uh, the other. When you look at the rhetoric, one thing that comes up very often is how leaders, African leaders, at least whether it's South African, uh, Kenyan, you know, but also Senegal or Ghana, how they present themselves as the gateway to Africa, and that's something that started with South Africa in the 90s. This idea we are the economic gateway. You can consider us as the leader of the continent. Uh, South Africa played a lot on this discourse. In the 2000s, African economies diversified. South Africa is not the only uh, big economy anymore. Uh, But what's interesting to see is how all these other countries, also Morocco, you know, uh, 
positioning themselves as gateways uh, to the continent. Uh, what I'm seeing is that, well, it seems to benefit them, all of them maybe not equally, but they all seem to get something out of this. And so uh, another aspect as I'm talking about gateway, another uh, rhetoric is one of stability. Uh, Senegal, well, before the the, the riots of these last days, uh, used to present itself also as you know, a democratic and politically stable environment. Um, and so let's say that there's, there's no resentment in the sense that sometimes these, these projects, these, some of the mega projects are very much uh, trans-regional, right? Or oh, sorry, cross-regional. So um, it's also for, if you look at the West Africa region, it's also in their interest to come together. Uh, and negotiate with China uh, or bring in ECOWAS in the discussions. So those are the, the, the different, let's say, strategies that I'm seeing, right, in terms of attracting. Well, it, it doesn't uh, necessarily translate into equal engagement by China, Russia and all, but at least it allows African governments and nations to have more partners. In, in this game. And I wanted just to say something about a reverse competition by uh, China, uh, Turkey, and so on, because we are talking about competition among African nations, but in some cases, and in specifically in some countries, um, since Africa is being the subject of interest uh, for many, you have this tendency now where China is competing with Russia, or China is competing with Turkey, or Turkey is competing with India, you know, for um, contracts, infrastructure contracts, for mining contracts. Uh, I'm thinking about Guinea, I'm thinking about uh, Kenya, I'm thinking about also Senegal, uh, you know, there are specific projects there where uh, Turkey and China are competing. And so African governments tend to use this interest in order uh, again, to diversify uh, partnerships and also not to depend too much on China, you know, for, for infrastructure projects, but also to get maybe better deals in terms of negotiations. I'm thinking about mining contracts in, in, uh, in Guinea, where uh, China and Russia are almost, at least for the last uh, you know, three to five years, are increasingly competing. And one thing, and that's again another anecdote that I've seen, is how China and Turkey compete, um, that was in Benin, you know, how, how Turkey, Turkish uh, embassy at least was also sponsoring, uh, the economic representation more specifically, was sponsoring a leaflet uh, where they were showing po- with three to five bullet points how better they are than China and how their contractors you know, are more competitive in China. So those are new dynamics, actually. This is something that you would have never seen five to ten years ago. And so I think there is where African actors are also increasingly having more opportunities to to exert more agency, and some of them are just using this better than others. You are absolutely right. That is also my impression for Lashade. And I was uh, speaking with my colleague Renu Modi uh, on India-Africa relations last week. And she was saying that these new principles that India has formulated in 2018, Prime Minister Narendra Modi outlined 10 principles. These are somewhat different and from China's in particular. And when I had a look at the principles, one of the first two principles, actually, they, they touch upon how important it is for India to recognize African priorities. And so so while in many ways India maybe is showing that it is different from others by allowing perhaps more of an articulation of African agency, at least in the official rhetoric. So you know, if we can move on to this animal or this umbrella of South-South cooperation that India and China often have been using and many other countries, including Brazil, 
my impression is, and I'd like to hear your views on it, my impression is that there's often this narrative or the the discourse is framed around terms like win-win, mutual benefit, solidarity, stuff that you were mentioning earlier in our conversation that gives the impression that unlike Western powers, this is different. There is much more recognition for African agency. Is that your impression too, that that this umbrella of South-South cooperation has changed somewhat, that the, the rules of the game are different now? Well, I would say that South-South co- cooperation and its principles, you know, have definitely throughout the years changed the development landscape and also all the debates around aid. More and more, you know, even when you look at the DAC donors from the OECD, they talk more about development cooperation than they talk about aid. And so there has been some kind of a reverse socialization, if I can call it that way, you know, the, in the sense that the fact that African governments have been increasingly engaging with southern partners, you know, to the detriment, let's say that, to the detriment of Western uh, traditional donors, has pushed Western countries to rethink the way they engage with Africa. But, you know, South-South cooperation is many things. It used to be in the early 60s and in the ideological context of the Cold War, it used to be very much, you know, about alliances, the Bandung Summit, non-alignment movements, you know, it was about ideology. Today, this has changed a lot. South-South cooperation now refers to a much broader framework for collaboration among countries of the South, you know, whether it's in the political, economic, social cultural, environmental, technical, you know, educational domains. And when you look at this South-South agenda, where and it's, you know, the South-South agenda is determined or is discussed historically at the United Nations, but also in the non-alignment summit, India was very, was a strategic player there and still is, you know, in terms of defining this agenda. But when you look at how it is carried out, concretely in these various countries. Yes, I would say that it's much more demand-driven. I I won't say win-win necessarily because, and I'll get back to this whole win-win rhetoric, but first of all, it's demand-driven, definitely. They take more into account African demands. And that's also, you know, at at a certain point, it's also a bit more, you know, you're talking about countries where, questions related to, you know, morality, respect, traditions are very much important. And I'm saying that because in the various interviews that I've done with all these leaders over the years, something that comes up very often is at least the Southern partners, you know, and I'm putting China, India and so on in, in, in it, at least they are, you know, giving us a bit more consideration and respect by by listening and by acknowledging that we are able to know what is good for us. You know, so when you look at just that aspect of it's, I don't know if it's morality. Is it about making African leaders and their representatives more comfortable at ease that, that, you know, I, I know I'm also a developing country and I know the kind of problems that you are facing, we've resolved them, and therefore what I have to say is more credible than these Westerners, Northerners who, who you know, don't know what, what, what you're really facing. It's, it's the credibility, right? It's the cred- it, That's definitely part of the rhetoric, and that, that, that has always been, you know, the definition of South-South cooperation, you know, as a strategy or as a development practice. It's about sharing knowledge, skills, expertise, and resources to meet development goals through these concerted efforts, but also, you know, as a way of saying we've been there. You know, we 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 have the same, more or less, you know, the same structural issues. So let's share what uh, our solutions have been to address these issues. Uh, and so, in in that regard, 
You know, it's something that talks more to uh, African leaders than traditional Western, you know, aid discourse. And also one thing that is important to take into account is that, you know, I mentioned this whole demand driven. That's one of the main strategies of South, the South-South Cooperation Agenda, whether you look at the Buenos Aires Action Plan or the Nairobi uh, meeting, you know, this concept of d- demand-driven d- development. Uh, and so, yes, that's part of the rhetoric. Now, when you look, that's where we can become a bit more critical, is that when you look at how it's carried out, it's, you know, not always... Like, the, the ideology, the ideas, the, the win-win rhetoric is not always in the in the advantage of African nations. Business consideration also come into the game. So there are some small wins and some big wins, right? <laughs> exactly. That's uh, maybe African governments win a bit more mm. with China. And, uh, and they, again, you need to look at it on a case-by-case basis. But de- it's definitely not uh, a symmetrical uh, win-win uh, relation. Because even in South-South relations, there are some asymmetries. I think that's a great point. Let's move on to another set of issues related to what we were just talking about, Fola Shade, which really has to do with, again, the agency issue and also negotiations. So let's assume that in one of these major summits, there's been some agreement that there will be a project or several projects between either China, and I know you've been studying China, Africa, more than the other South-South cooperation partners. Let's say China has decided with a country in Africa to do certain projects, investment decisions are being made. What characterizes then the kind of negotiations that take place once that decision is made? So you're involving leaders, We are talking about maybe lots of ministries, lots of officials, their Chinese counterparts, and there may be the fear that we can't be too hard in negotiating because the money may go somewhere else. What are we offering? How do we make ourselves as attractive as possible? And sometimes I feel that countries go too out of their way to make it attractive, like, you know, maybe offering land and water and electricity for free. I don't know. So what what is your take on this? I know you've been studying the kind of deal-making process, the negotiations that take place. How are these negotiated, Fulashade? What kind of strategies do African governments adopt when they negotiate, when they sit across the table from their Chinese counterparts? Well, let's say that it, it's it's quite large, right? Because there are just so many different practices, negotiation practices. And uh, that's why I've decided also to look at it from a more bottom-up approach, more empirical um, you know, perspective. Uh, let's say that the, the key trends that I've, that I've seen there is that first, as you mentioned, they are most of these deals you know, are discussed, the premises are discussed in multilateral settings. FOCAC is key here. You're right. Um, But also, you know, and you asked that question before about bilateral negotiations. All these summits, whether it's China, Africa, uh, Turkey, Africa, Russia, Africa, they are all venues for bilateral negotiations. And so it's during these bilateral negotiations that, you know, there are, discussions about opportunities to fund specific infrastructure projects, because I mainly focus on infrastructure negotiations. And there it, it comes, let's say it starts at the multilateral level, and then progressively it comes down you know, to the national level. Uh, because at these summits, whether it's minister, ministers or presidents, they, are, they got... Um, they received, you know, um, uh, promises uh, for funding. But at the same time, most of these promises or pledges are tied, especially when it's Exim bank loans. Well, the Chinese don't like to use this word, word of tied aid, you know, uh, but there are conditionalities. And that is that, you know, Chinese contractors, in the case of Exim bank loans, need to 
construct and implement the project. It's very different when we are talking about projects, infrastructure projects that are funded on national budgets, African national budgets. But when I'm talking here about uh, you know projects on Exim Bank loans. What happens next is that Chinese contractors, you know, they are also going uh, international. Most of them, they are looking for deals outside of China. Um, you know, there's also an overproduction of some materials of steel and aluminium and so on. Uh, so they are looking for markets and then they tend to reach out to the Chinese economic missions and ambassadors in these African countries. And together they reach out to African um, governments. And when I'm talking about African governments, there's a stark variation across African governments in how they engage with China on these infrastructure projects. Uh, In some cases, like you mentioned Rwanda, Ethiopia, you know, I also think South Africa to some extent, there's a specific unit, you know, within the Ministry of Planning or the Ministry of Development, uh, you know, that is uh, considered as the focal point. And so whether it's the Chinese, the Russian or the Turkey, they need to be engaging with this specific unit first. But in other countries, um, you know, in, in Benin or in Mali, or uh, also in, um, I saw cases in Cameroon, for instance, or, or Gabon, where this Chinese delegation, uh, delegation directly targets technical ministries. So they would go and speak directly to the Ministry of Public Works, the, the Ministry of Infrastructure. And this can create some issues because when there's no coordination internally at the African level, uh, the negotiations tend to be, you know, some of the discussions around norms, around uh, labor, uh, around, I'm talking about norms with construction norms, for instance, environment norms, tend not to be respected or not to be integrated as they should in the contract, right? And it's also, it's, it also open ways sometimes for corruption. So that's at, the, the, at that level, right? And then there are three levels, actually. There's the pre-negotiation stage, you know, where there's a where they need to organize the negotiation tables uh, and discuss. And the issue that arises there is that from the Chinese side, there's a mix of capital, uh, maybe capital is not the word, but they are both representatives from the economic, they are economic actors, you know, it's the capital and the state. Let's put it that way. These two are present at the negotiation table on the Chinese side, whether, whereas on the African side of the negotiation table, it's mostly political and technical. And so this already creates a tension because, you know, they very often the Chinese are considered as very aggressive. They are perceived as aggressive, but it's because even at the negotiation table, the ambassador, the Chinese ambassador tends not to, you know, he, he doesn't talk a lot. It's mostly the economic actors. They are here you know, to do business. And so, you know, the, there again, you no, know, but it has changed over time, you know, in, with countries even like Benin that I've studied a lot, in Cameroon as well, more and more they bring in experts because there's an issue both in terms of translation, you know, at the negotiation table, the, uh, the translators are, sometimes it's only the Chinese side that comes with a no a translator, whereas the African side also should have its own. Uh, so language issues, cultural barriers tend also to create some divergences. But, you know, it's something that has changed over time because more and more some countries, some African countries also rely on their, some students that are now back, let's say African students who, who went to China to study there and who came back, Rwanda I said, has a very strong program, you know, of mutualizing um, knowledge from these students. Whereas um, another example is also Benin, who's bringing in uh, China experts, uh, it's for, uh, former Chinese officials who used to work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or who used to work at the Ministry of, uh, of uh, the MOFCOM, at the Uni- Ministry of Commerce in China, and who are able to 
let's say, bridge the gap a bit between the understanding the, or the misunderstandings at the negotiation table for the African side. So that's the, nego- the negotiation tables. When you move on further, you know, the, when the negotiation takes place, one of the, the aspects that need to be negotiated a lot is local content, you know, knowledge transfer and ensuring compliance with standards, because that's a very strong criticism towards Chinese projects, compliance with uh, construction, environment, employment, also labor norms. And that is sometimes difficult to negotiate in these Exim Bank projects, these projects with Exim Bank loans, because they are very much, the conditionality is very much aligned on well, Chinese interests. But uh, more and more, in many cases, uh, you can see now that these countries are succeeding you know, in saying, well, okay, you come with a loan, but we have our national standards and you need to respect them, right? You need to, to apply them in uh, the various projects. And so strategies for ensuring that there's a respect of international or national standards is that, uh, first of all, more and more, they ensure that there's an independent control you know, office or uh, an office that reviews you know the all these standards during the implementation phase of the project and one strategy that came up is that they are very often asking a western right to monitor that right yeah to monitor that i'm thinking about louis uh, louis berger for instance louis berger uh, that is a um, it's a you know a company uh, based in france or in london i think but uh, who very often is uh, reviewing you know the the this project because otherwise this chinese carried out project they are both you know uh, judge and jury and implementer and and so then at the end you don't it's difficult once the once the contract is signed it's very difficult to come back uh, on it uh, and so those are the issues that that come up often at at this stage at least of implementing or at least negotiating the implementation of this project it's more and more african nations now take an external control uh, office uh, that is not an agent uh, of of china You're raising some really fascinating points here, Polasha, because I, you know, I often hear the Chinese saying that you can't really criticize us because we always respect and comply with local standards. So we, if, you know, if it's insufficient, it's because the, the African country in question has insufficient standards. So don't criticize us. But going back to this uh, negotiating styles, etc., I think it is extremely important that we are aware that it's not just in relation to, say, China, but low-income countries often in international in multilateral discussions, whether be it, you know, at UN sessions or whatever, there's often this this kind of lack of sometimes one doesn't have enough resources, one doesn't have legal and financial mm. expertise that is required for complex negotiations. You know, you could have 10 people. It's like 10 lawyers sitting across you and you're just represented by one public defender, that kind of feeling. So obviously, if you have, as you were saying, that South Africa has an agency to negotiate, then, then you're in a stronger point, uh, in a stronger situation than in a in a country where you don't have that kind of expertise. And obviously, there are different types of ne- negotiating styles. And and as you were saying, in say in West Africa, if the if the Chinese companies go directly to a ministry, obviously that could lead to all kinds of problems of policy coherence that that one ministry doesn't know what another ministry has negotiated. So a final set of issues I wanted to ask you, Folashade, is if you were to think about the future and if you were to advise African governments, ministers, uh, officials in terms of negotiating styles or, or, or techniques and to empower African negotiators even more than others, and perhaps also to advise them to uh, to uh, not just keep these uh, 
discussion secret, but to actually involve the public, what would you suggest? What kind of strategy should African leaders, governments, agencies adopt in the near future? How can they get the best deals from not just China, but from you know whichever actor is coming to Africa to invest, to collaborate, to provide some sort of expertise and assistance? Well, I would start by saying that it's already very important for even the tiniest African nation to understand that if a big country like China you know, or India or Russia you know, wants to engage with them, it's because they have an interest in engaging with them. And so just this is already an important factor to keep in mind that they also need you. Mm. How small you know you are isn't necessarily the reason not to negotiate the best deal. And to it's not a reason why they should just accept everything because there's finance on the table. Right? Because that's often what's happening. It's that they fear, you know, we, we discussed this competition among African nations, they fear that the, the finance uh, opportunity or the funding opportunity would go to another nation. Uh, and so then they tend to accept whatever right. uh, deal that's on the table or they negotiate not in their own interest and in their population interest. So a few advice that I would give is the first one to be to have a coherent internal policy coordination. China is the continent's first trade partner. Right. And China is the top, I think, the fifth investor now in Africa. But very few countries have a China strategy. But they do have, you know, strategies for other countries. So at least they have a strategy for the EU, for instance, uh, or the EU has a strategy for them. But China, you know, they, there's no China strategy. There should be one. So it's important to come up with one that is inclusive and by inclusive i mean that engages with uh, the large uh, the larger state apparatus and that is not only concentrated whether it's in the presidency's um, office or the 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 ministry of foreign affairs uh, it's important you know to engage with various levels of the state apparatus so that's a korean strategy that's the first advice the second one is you know, getting maybe to know, uh, to inc- let's say to increase knowledge, to get to know China better. And so, you know, to build on existing knowledge. In the, during the Cold War, there were so many African students that went to China, that went to, uh, to study in China. And so now they are back and they act as brokers in the China-Africa business but they are not mobilized by their governments. For, you know, they are not included in the negotiation teams. And so that's, all, that's also one thing that is important, you know, to, to be able to understand better and maybe then to avoid all these misinterpretation issues due to language and culture barriers and styles, you know, negotiation styles. Having someone, or having an African national who has lived studied and maybe worked a bit in China, you know, to some extent it can be an asset. So it's about mobilizing the best capacities internally and also external ones. You mentioned um, the legal aspects. Uh, mobilizing external expertise in Africa-China negotiations is something you know, that has been raised also a lot. And there is some expertise available outside. You have um, NLGI, uh, the Natural Resource uh, Governance Initiative that also provides uh, assistance. They set up modeling system uh, to verify economic and fiscal consistencies in mining projects because the state has little room for maneuver you know, on the use of its own resources in many cases, uh, in, in at least when these negotiations are on the table. So mobilizing external legal expertise the ALSF, that's the African Leader, African Legal 
a facility. It's it has been set up by it's attached to the African Development Bank. Um, you have Connex International. They, they, there is some legal expertise out there, um, and you know one thing that is also important is to learn from one another. Uh, I've been involved in setting up this series of knowledge sharing seminars where African negotiators come together from various African countries to to discuss and to learn from one another, right? It's, that's the, 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 let's say that's one of the key ideas in South-South cooperation because m- most of them are engaging with the same Chinese corporations, uh, but they don't get the same output, right? So learning one from another, sharing lessons, being able to understand why is it that, you know, you succeeded where I failed is also something that is very important to prepare better uh, negotiations, right? And I think we should, the final uh, aspect here is to look at all of this, not only at the national level, but also at the regional African level, to involve the African Union, to have a regional strategy you know, for engagement with, uh, with China or to be able to provide support for African governments. Um, because what I've, sh- I've shown in my articles is that African governments have shown resilience, they have innovated in negotiations in various ways, whether it's at the bureaucratic, you know, middle, uh, or let's say low level or middle level civil servants, um, whether it's small countries, despite the asymmetries, you know, they were able to find a set of solutions to orient the negotiations in their favor. But it's important to have a framework agreement at the African Commission or at the NEPAD level, you know, if, uh, and invite China to have a dialogue, you know, and this will only allow Africans to better organize themselves and also to, to um, you know, bridge the, the gap of misunderstandings that happen often at the negotiation table. And very often it comes down to small things, you know, like uh, the the way the contract has been written, you know, the, they don't understand the same. They ha- they don't understand the same thing. You know, when the contract is translated in French, it's an it's another style, or in English, uh, it, it, the African side and the Chinese side, they they don't have the same understanding. And then once the contract is signed, you know, there are several issues due to this lack of, of knowledge of the other, of, of understanding. So, no, it's important at a practical and operational level to have this China team within these African bureaucracies and the state apparatus, and also to have this discussion at the African Union level. For Lashade, it was such a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. It was a pleasure as well. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.